Okay, so I'd like to talk with you tonight about one of the foundational principles and teachings of the Buddha, and one that you find in other traditions as well. And it's the fundamental principle that's typically expressed in, in the Buddhist canon as non-harming. Now, as uh, Dan Brooks, I think, um, during the time when we were just getting ready to start here tonight before 6 p.m., pointed out, there's also, of course, the positive form of this alongside not harming could be offering benefit or helping, being constructive, contributing, uh, loving, not just not hating. Both are really true. I'll tend to explore this and the ways in which the Buddha explored it in terms of non-harming, but it's important to appreciate that there's the positive aspect of this as well. That's the other side of the coin. The principle of non-harming may seem initially like a cliche, you know, don't be a jerk, don't be evil, right? <laughs> it's kind of a low bar that Google has, you know, as a basic standard, don't be evil. Pretty easy to do. Yeah, if you really get into the depths of it, arguably non-harming is a principle and a practice that can take you all the way to awakening, particularly as you explore subtler and subtler aspects of this. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, it is said that there are three fundamental pillars of practice, uh, sila, samadhi, and panya in Pali, which could be translated as virtue, concentration, and wisdom. Virtue is the basic principle of morality, characterized certainly by non-harming, building on that foundation of regulation of ourselves and so that we stay out of trouble as much as possible. Then on that foundation, as the mind kind of clears, we can focus on purifying the mind and training the mind and depths of concentration. And then building on that foundation then can be liberating insight that is the basis for the, for the highest and, and farthest reaching wisdom. So there's this progression, morality, mental training, ultimate wisdom. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have any wisdom or mental training until you really get your act together uh, morally, uh, such as in terms of not killing, not stealing, not lying, not getting intoxicated, and not harming yourself and others through sexual misconduct, which are the five primary precepts morally in the Buddhist tradition that are taken not as commandments from on high, but pragmatically as trainings as practices we undertake, knowing that we won't necessarily be perfect at them. And we keep trying. So there is that foundational element, certainly. But even as you maybe struggle with regulating yourself in some of those five major ways, um, particularly perhaps with sexuality and intoxicants, which tend to be among the most difficult for people, um, even as you're, you're grappling with that, there's still a place for training your mind and purifying it and still a place for accumulating wisdom. That said, there is loosely a kind of natural progression, kind of a developmental trajectory that moves through virtue, then concentration, then wisdom. Non-harming is particularly relevant in the first of these, and that's very often how it's talked about. What happens though, as one moves into concentration, into the development of mindfulness and a growing internal stillness and um, coming together, a kind of a unification of consciousness, uh, as one progresses in that, one becomes aware of subtler and subtler forms of contraction, including self-contraction, subtler and subtler forms of pressure, insistence, that we impose upon ourselves and whereby we harm ourselves and sometimes others too. So as we gradually release subtler forms of self-harming and even other harming, uh, as we release um, clutter in the mind, poisons of different kinds in our mind, oh, as we release those harms, we become more concentrated. And even with wisdom, as we engage wisdom, very often the essence of that wisdom 
is recognizing subtle forms of harm that we were doing to others or to ourselves, including sometimes setting ourselves up, even if in the moment it all kind of feels great and the music is playing and the feeling is groovy, rut row, um, we could be setting ourselves or others up for future harms. And it's through the discernment of wisdom, the realization and insight of wisdom, that those subtler and subtler harms fall away. So the principle of non-harming can carry us all the way through. All right, with this introduction, I'd like to do a little experiment here and teach in a way that I don't typically do, primarily through reading key quotations that I've selected uh, from the um, earliest uh, written record of the Buddha's teachings with a few bonuses tossed in as well. And these are, these are sayings, these are teachings that have really been important and meaningful for me. They've, they've really struck me. And so I'm gonna offer them to you. And as I offer this talk, I invite you to, to relate to it as, as best we can. We're hearing the voice of the Buddha or related close companions in practice. Through translation, through some distortions, undoubtedly, but still, it's like there's a pure tone. It's like you can hear the melody even amidst some static and crackle, like in these movies of people listening, let's say during World War II, to music being played over the radio. There's some crackle, but you can still hear the through line of the song. We're, we're hearing the teachings of real people coming down to us over the centuries and sharing with us their hard-won, practical wisdom with regard to practice and what serves the uh, relieving of suffering and the awakening of the most profound and sublime inner peace and the highest happiness. So I kind of relate to it in that way. Let the words land, let them sink in. You can come back to the quotations. Um, I will try to email you all this set of quotations and the email that will go out on Saturday. In fact, I'll do that, um, that will have um, the recording of this talk, okay? So I invite you to listen to it in that way. And then as after I've moved through them, I'll offer a few comments and then we'll open it up for some discussion. You kind of let them land in you. Okay, here we go. It's, it will be an experiment for me as well. As an overarching, uh, simple, pithy teaching, from the Buddha about the three sort of fundamental aspects that we can keep in mind. He says, abstain from all unwholesome deeds, perform wholesome ones, purify your mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. And when I say he, the Buddha said it, it could well be close companions or followers, even a few years after he passed away. But it's the Buddhist stream is the way I think about it. So overarching, you know, um, abstain from what's unwholesome as you decide. One, two, cultivate the good and purify your mind. Really, really, really fundamental, isn't it? Okay, so here we go. First major theme, what we do matters. So from the Sutta Nipata, one is not low because of birth, nor does birth make one holy. Deeds alone make one low. Deeds alone make one holy. It's not about your caste that you're born into. It's not about uh, having a male body or a female body or something that transcends those categories, it's not about that. It's about acts, deeds of thought and word and body. That's the fundamental matter, which was radical for the Buddha's time. What we do matters. Another quote from the Dhammapada, little though one recites the sacred texts, but puts the teaching into practice. Forsaking lust, hatred, and delusion, with true wisdom and emancipated mind, clinging to nothing of this or any other world, one indeed partakes of the blessings of a holy life. 
In other words, it's not about mere scholasticism or theology, mere capacity to rote repetition of various sacred teachings. It's about putting them into practice in your own real life. Also, no, no mother nor father nor any other kin can do greater good for oneself than a mind directed well. Isn't that interesting? Nobody can help us any more than we can help ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then I find this quotation just fantastic and from Suzuki Roshi, both in terms of what we do matters and kind of hopeful because the previous ones can sound, oh my gosh, I gotta be perfect all the time. And as Suzuki Roshi says, I don't know so much if there are enlightened beings, but I know there are enlightened moments. Wow. It's the moments of non-harming. It's the moments of blessing, of contributing, of loving, of protecting yourself, of being strong for yourself. These are, these are the moments that matter. And that's all we're called to in the present the only place we ever live, in the present, non-harming, in the present, um, you know, getting a little better every day, at, uh, uh, in the present, uncovering a little more every day, uh, the good news that was always already true. That's wonderful. It's, a, it's the moments in the present that are, that are enlightened. Okay? So, my first major theme here what we do matters. What we do matters, including seemingly little things. Second major theme, train your mind. There is a lot of this in uh, the collection of the Buddha's teachings, so the so-called Pali Canon, Pali being the language of early Buddhism. Train your mind. So, from the Dhammapada. You are your own master. You make your future. Therefore, discipline yourself as a horse dealer trains a thoroughbred. By the way, there are a fair number of references in the agrarian pastoral culture, patriarchal as well, of the Buddhist time to various things. And then we have sometimes arguable or kind of funky translations of them. So, you know, some of what I'm going to be sharing with you here is helpfully understood in that framework. But here you have the own point. You are your own master. You make your future. You will inherit. I will inherit the results, for better or worse, of our actions. We are our own master. We make our own future. Therefore, discipline yourself, not in a harsh way, not in a harsh way, but in a skillful way, as let's say someone who has a good heart uh, might train a horse. Um, okay, the Buddha was a farmer <laughs> as, a, as a young man. Here's another quotation from the Dhammapada. Irrigators regulate the rivers. Fletchers straighten the arrow shaft. Carpenters shape the wood. The wise control themselves. There is a place for regulation. Now, as the Buddha uh, kind of used the famous metaphor to someone who was asking him, you know, about self-control and seemed to be getting pretty uptight about it, um, the Buddha used the metaphor of a lute, a guitar. And uh, the metaphor being that when you uh, tune it, you should not over-tighten the string, nor make it too loose. Uh, I think there's a metaphor from Zen I've heard, um, feel free to correct me, that we should train our own minds like the skillful rider of a horse, with neither too loose nor too tight a rein. So it's in that framework as, of course, the middle way, gee, what a, what a concept, right, in Buddhism, that we should regulate ourselves and control ourselves. Another quotation from the Dhammapada, one should do what one teaches others to do. This one landed on me, let me tell you. Uh, as a parent, a therapist, a teacher, a writer, 
One should do what one teaches others to do. We need to walk or talk. If one, sh- if one would train others, one should be well-controlled oneself. Difficult indeed is self-control. In other words, don't underestimate uh, what's involved in this fundamental practice of non-harming and self-regulation. Another quote, the wise are controlled in bodily action. If we think about people we appreciate, there, there's a sense of, of um, both spontaneity and also appropriate regulation of themselves. The wise are controlled in speech and controlled in thought. They are truly well controlled. Also, the Dhammapada, wonderful it is to train the mind so swiftly moving, seizing whatever it wants. Good it is to have a well-trained mind, for a well-trained mind brings happiness. I was in a small group with the Zen teacher, Yvonne Rand, uh, whose, I think, center has the wonderful name Goat in the Road <laughs> in California, loosely related, I think, to Tassajara and San Francisco Zen Center and Green Gold's Goat in the Road. And um, Yvonne just used this word that just got me in my early encounters with Buddhism. Uh, she said, it's a training. A lot of what we're engaged with is a training. Like, whoa, training, a training. You know, we don't want to get turned off by that because maybe we have a background with trainings of different kinds that were problematic. But there is an aspect of this that we're training. And I find that really helpful. We can learn. We can develop. We can train ourselves. So you find that word training or related ideas about it really throughout um, the Buddhist teachings. And then a really important point here for ourselves and for others If one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? This is a very important teaching. I'll repeat it. If one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? So we have the deep recurring kind of metaphor of the river that we're that we're the river of suffering that we're trying to cross and also the idea that it's really okay to nurture oneself to protect oneself to develop you know oneself fully in part for the sake of others because if we are carried away by the river of reactivity the river of greed hatred heartache and delusion then ugh, We can't be of much use to other people. It's okay to fill up our own cup. It's okay to put our own oxygen mask on first, as it were, in the airplane. And then on the basis of that, standing on our own stable footing, knowing our own place where we stand, then we can be more helpful to others. Okay. So this theme, train your mind. Now the next theme, harm less, help more. From the Sutta Nipata. As I am, so are others. As others are, so am I. Having thus identified self and others, harm no no one, nor have them harmed. Here's the deep teaching around non-harming, of recognizing that um, we're profoundly interdependent and interconnected. If we harm others, typically what goes around comes around, right? And kaboom comes back to us. Um, I love the definition of karma uh, from Stephen Gaskin of the Monday night class back in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. Karma being hitting golf balls in a shower, right? Kaboom comes back to us. So we recognize it, not just hitting golf balls, but offering benefit to others. It comes back to us as well. And there's a really deep teaching there. And here I'd like to offer briefly a story from a friend of mine who trained as a monk in uh, Southeast Asia uh, for some many months in a row. And during this training, when he first came there as a Westerner, an American, landing in Southeast Asia, he was pointed to a hut, uh, a kuti, where he was to meditate many, many hours a day, kind of left to his own devices. And there was a pit toilet nearby that he was to use for himself. And um, 
after some time there, a week or two, he just noticed how cranky he was and he, he just couldn't settle in and you know his meditation wasn't going very well. And, and, he, and he was also kind of wondering about this pit toilet that you know after using it, there's a bucket of water he would use to kind of clean, it, clean up the area, wash things down. And he noticed that as he did that, a number of ants would gather and other little insects to get the water there and you know he was washing them away. Uh, in you know what he was doing, so he decided he would just mention this to the kind of the monk there who was the person he was talking with about his practice, and so he was describing his practice, and then he asked the monk, by the way, you know, uh, just I want to check that something's okay here. Uh, there's this toilet there, and a lot of ants and bugs are crawling around because they want the water, but you know when I when I clean the area with a bucket of water. Some of them get swept away. You know, is that okay? And the monk just stared at him. As my friend relayed, uh, you know, the episode to me, the monk just stared at him and said, is that your precept? And the precept he took, among others, was not to kill any living thing. Not to kill, certainly through his own direct action, any living thing. Mosquito, ant, snake, human, any living thing. Wow. And my friend was startled, but he said, okay. And he took on himself this practice of non-harming. Very carefully, you can imagine, very carefully not um, killing any little insects around the pit toilet. And he noticed, interestingly, and perhaps not coincidentally, right around the same time, that his practice began to flourish. And as he described to me, and he's a very rational business kind of person, uh, not prone to you know, <laughs> cosmic woo-woo-ness. He said, you know, Rick, it just was like when I shifted out of hurting creatures around me, when I shifted out of that, somehow I felt that all of nature was supporting me and my own practice. In other words, what he was doing was coming back in this way. And that story has really landed on me, and I've reflected on it many times. As I am, so are others. As others are, so am I. Continuing here. From the Samyutta Nikaya. Knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest, too. A lot of the ways we harm people is through tone. You know, one of the elements of wise speech, right speech, is not harsh tone. So with carefulness about tone, and that's something as well, you know, I was telling a little story just before we began um, tonight, uh, formally at 6 p.m., just about my own reaction to getting the feedback from people that they couldn't hear me. And I thought, well, it's your fault you can't hear me. You know, Zoom says I'm not muted, but really it was my fault because I had not turned on a little microphone device so you could actually hear me. And, you know, little subtleties of tone. I know more than you. I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> what a dingling. <laughs> you know, those little subtleties are ways of harming other people. And often they're driven by our anger. Okay. Here's another one. I love this one. Deeply, deeply, deeply. This is the positive form of this. With good will for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. From the Sutta Nipata. With good will for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart. Above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. Harm less, help more. Then choose the greater happiness. This is my next overarching theme. If by renouncing a lesser happiness, one may realize a greater happiness, let the wise one renounce the lesser, having regard for the greater. This is a really key point. Often the choice is not between good and evil or between pleasure and pain. Those choices are pretty easy usually. Very often the choice is between, you know, 
a greater happiness, particularly uh, deferred, you know, a little more in the future, but growing and growing and growing, compared to the immediate gratification of fill in the blank. You know, being snippy at that person, having that third glass of wine or the first glass of wine, as the proverb puts it, you take the drink, the drink takes the drink, the drink takes you, right? Um, so, you know, it's like greater happiness compared to lesser happiness. And wisdom is having the understanding that, you know, I'm going to pay a price down the road for what I'm doing here. And one of the things I, I like to think about is Rick tomorrow. You could think about you tomorrow. I mean, you could think about Rick tomorrow too and, you know, be nice to me, but no, no. I'm talking about you thinking about you tomorrow. Um, what are you giving to that future you? The one over whom you have enormous power. In what little ways, maybe occasionally some big ones, are you offering a gift? Are you setting that you, you will be when you wake up tomorrow morning? Are you setting that you up in the best possible ways? With a little bit of extra training of the mind, a little more releasing, relinquishing what's burdensome and afflictive, for you and others, a little more skillfulness, doing a little work in the outer world maybe to do what you can to support your circumstances. What are you giving to that future being? And to what extent, looking downstream to the past, are you receiving and appreciating some of the beneficial contributions of the you you were yesterday or the day before yesterday? And to sharpen the point, you know, to what extent are you in a bit of a pickle today or dealing with the consequences today of not so wise, maybe more harmful ways of acting with thought, word, and deed um, of yourself in times past. Not to beat yourself up again and again about it, but to learn the lesson and be a little better today. Right? That's a way to think about this. You're making an offering, you're making a contribution that leads to a greater happiness. It's kind of simple in, in, in a way. I mean, doing it can be more complicated, but the action itself, choosing the greater happiness, um, you know, let, and opening yourself up to be drawn, not white knuckling, but drawn toward the greater good. That's a real skillful way of being. As I said in the Meditation tonight, I think in a lot of ways, meditation and broadly practice is about resting our mind upon what draws our heart. You know, being in effect loved into being by what draws us in the most wholesome and profound ways. And having that be the, the current, you know, the updraft, the wellspring of our living into the next moment. That can, you can feel very supported in that way of being as you move toward the greater happiness and increasingly relinquish the lesser one. Okay. Here's another one uh, summarized as, um, you know, find gladness in your goodness. Uh, that's from a different teaching, but it's a kind of a paraphrase. Here we go from the Dhammapada. The doer of good rejoices here and hereafter. One rejoices in both the worlds, here and hereafter, in a cosmology that talked about rebirth. We don't have to believe that necessarily if you don't want to, but that's what this is speaking to in this life and in potential future ones. The doer of good rejoices here and hereafter. One rejoices in both the worlds. One rejoices and exults, recollecting one's own pure deeds. Really an interesting teaching here in a pretty ascetic tradition that it's okay to take pleasure in your own goodness. It's okay to celebrate, exult, to celebrate in you know the good deeds of others and the good deeds of yourself and to be glad about it. You know, a little pat on the back. Like, that was hard and I didn't suck. <laughs> good on you. <ya. laughs> you know, that's a good one. You did good there. You tried, you went. You know, it didn't turn out, but you you gave it your you're all, you know, you, you left it all in the playing field. You, you didn't hold back. <clears throat> you did good. It's okay to, to appreciate that. And as You know, think about this as a little practice. When you go to bed uh, every night, you know, you might think about one thing you're grateful for, you're thankful for, and one thing that you 
can appreciate about yourself that day. You can add other things if you like, but just right there. And then if you like, a third one thing is to um, kind of lean in. What is it that you want to lean into being tomorrow? So for today, you know, one thing you're thankful for before falling asleep, one thing you can appreciate about yourself, and one way of being, a sense of being, maybe a, a thought or a principle, could well be like a feeling or an attitude or an inclination in your body. You sort of want to prime, you want to lean into for tomorrow. That's a lovely way to fall asleep. Okay. Concluding this section, before I do the last one, then I'll open it up for discussion. Of all the fragrances, sandal, tagara, blue lotus, and jasmine, I have no idea what tagara and blue lotus smell like. Of all the fragrances, sandalwood, tagara, blue lotus, and jasmine, the fragrance of virtue is the sweetest. Isn't that great? The fragrance of virtue non-harming. And then last section, I'll move through this kind of directly, a life well lived, the last theme here. From Ralph Waldo Emerson, of all people, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, to know even when life has breathed easier because you have lived here. This is to have succeeded. From William Butler Yeats. We can make our minds so like still water that beings gather about us, that they may see, it may be, their own images, and so live for a moment with a clearer, perhaps even with a fiercer life because of our quiet. This is from Stevie Kalinich, who was a lyricist for the Beach Boys and is a, quite a poet, still alive, can doing really well, uh, raging against the dying of the light. Stevie's awesome. And uh, I'm going to quote him here. You know, you know you are. Be still and know you are. Now is the time life begins. Take that simple path and love will set you free. Be still. From the great Dharma teacher, Bill Murray, I realized the more fun I had, the better I did. I realized the more fun I had, the better I did. Sometimes people can approach practice in a grim, dour, glum way. If you're not miserable, you're not mindful. And no, I mean, we need to find joy. The Buddha was called the happy one. He wasn't grim and dour. He was radiant with, with a transcendent inner peace um, and, and joyfulness. Uh, joyfulness is skillful means. The Proximate cause of concentration is happiness in the Buddha Dharma. So as Bill Murray puts it, the, the more fun you have, the better you'll do, to paraphrase him. And then finally, the wonderful poet Isa, and one of my favorite haiku ever, on a branch floating down river, a cricket singing. You know, I think we're all, in a funny kind of way, crickets, you know, on a branch floating down river with no escape. Um, I think Suzuki Roshi said that uh, life is like setting out on a boat that you know will eventually sink. You know, <laughs> so there's a way in which we're all on branches floating down a river. And can we be singing? Can we be singing? Okay. Thank you for you know, participating in this experiment in way of teaching. Um, I'll send out these quotations uh, in the email that'll go out Saturday morning. Um, so I wanna see kind of from the comments, I think the comments in the, um, uh, the chat are, are really excellent and you can see them. So what I think what I'll do is, um, let's see here, 
go to some participants who've raised their hand. And I, I see Madison, you've raised your hand. So if you want to raise your hand and have me call on you, and just like I said previously, please make sure, please make sure that what you have to say is concise, a question of, and of general interest and related to what I've been talking about tonight. Okay. And great. With that said, all right, Madison, ask you to unmute. You can unmute yourself. Great. Thank you, Rick. Great you to bet. see you. Great to hear you. Okay. How do I know if it's of general interest? I don't. Um, here's the deal. I will spot with awareness when I have some anger and the other person is right there. And this just happened before meditation this evening. And a little warning sign goes off that says, get off the phone, get off the phone. Tell them you have to get off the phone. Tell them you can't speak to them. And instead there's another little voice that says, Ah, uh, come on, I got this. And so I wait in and I express um, some of the discontent. And then I get off the phone afterward and I feel guilt because there has been harm. And the deal is I feel like my anger was justified. My expression of it was inappropriate using your quotes. So I would love to know maybe your response to that because I'm stuck with this all the time. And there's a whole psychological paradigm. Oh, you're bipolar, you're this, you're that, if you don't have impulse control. But um, I have impulse warnings, but, but the control <laughs> system is not doing so well. So I'd, I'd love to know your comments. And I I hope that's not too specific. No, that's great. Cause you're really, it's a, right bullseye, bullseye, Madison. Um, and um, it, it's context, Madison and I are friends. So I, we know each other and um, I think it's right at the bullseye. So if you could maybe mute yourself just to prevent background noise, I'll speak to it. Um, I think we're really getting a very important thing that we can't be perfect in non-harming probably. I mean, it's really difficult even to walk on the, the ground and just know that unless you're almost frozen and immobilized, you'll probably step on something and kill it, right? To eat uh, vegetables, you're part of a process that inevitably kills some living things, pr pr primarily, uh, pr predominantly insects. But still, you know, living involves dying. We're part of this larger process. So then how do we do it? To paraphrase a really lovely teaching from Larry Yang, who um, says this more eloquently, but I'm going to kind of put it this way in, in this example here, Madison, you know, may I uh, respond to a phone call? even an unwanted phone call with utterly wise and perfect speech. If I cannot respond to an unwanted phone call with perfectly wise and well-regulated speech, may I limit the harshness in my tone? If I cannot limit the harshness in my tone at the time, can I catch myself during my response to the other person and acknowledge what I've done. If I cannot catch myself in real time, but in retrospect with the other person, um, may I, after the fact, communicate with them in some kind of way that apologizes and acknowledges and makes amends and attempts to repair, if that's at all possible and appropriate. And if I cannot or do not um, you know, reach out to the other person after the fact to try to clean up the mess, at least in my own heart, can I have a clear-eyed recognition of what happened with the genuine and sincere intention to do better next time? I think so much of life is like that. And we're just kind of acknowledging where we are on that, on that ladder you know, of more or less harmfulness. And uh, with the sincerity of undertaking the training precept, that's the frame of Buddhist morality as a training precept, uh, to, do, to be a little better tomorrow, you know, or at least make sincere efforts uh, along those lines. Okay. All right. 
A plus. Super. Thank you, Madison. And that's hopeful. That's hopeful. And we start to realize that if we're shaming ourselves and pounding ourselves, it's counterproductive because it gets in the way of being a little better next time. It's, it's not helpful. So in the service of non-harming, it doesn't help to be mean and horrible to ourselves. Okay. So I see that other person, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. You're just named as Zoom user, which is okay. You don't need to give your name if you don't want to. So you have your hand up, Zoom user. Just, great. Yeah. Me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask your uh, advice um, in terms of um, a sangha, maybe not literally, but uh, what I realized in, uh, in what you're saying is that, um, you know, the people you have around you make a big difference in, yeah. um, in what you're talking about. Um, and particularly during COVID, this COVID time, um, I mean, I see clients every day, but other than that, I'm pretty isolated. Yeah. Uh, and I wondered what you can advise for, um, I guess, having people around who have these kinds of um, goals, higher level goals yeah. and, are, and are up to it because it's just so easy to slip back, which I have. Yeah, that's, I think you're naming something very important. And for me, it's, it's, it's humbling and helpful just to face up to being profoundly social primates who are inherently designed to be really affected by the people around us. It's not a failure of practice to still be very affected by the people around us for better or worse. So therefore, as you're really getting at it there, it's just, it's wisdom. It's self-interested wisdom, and it's also selfless and moral wisdom to try to disengage from people that bring out the worst in us or kind of pollute our minds or, you know, just, uh, we feel less of who we are uh, when we're around them. You know, we're less inclined to take the high road rather than the low road when we're around them. And alternately, increase the influences in our life that are beneficial and wholesome. Um, as a kind of a saying that I, in effect, built on for this point I've made repeatedly tonight about resting your mind upon what draws your heart, the saying in the Dharma is that essentially your mind takes its shape from what it repeatedly rests upon. So if we're resting our minds, uh, with people who are contentious and resentful and quarrelsome and gossipy and envious and prejudiced and you know just um, not taking responsibility for their own lives, uh, well, you know that's going to tend to be our shape. On the other hand, if we spend more time around people who are are you know the more supportive, see the best in us, who are motivated themselves to, to grow and practice, we tend to be more inclined that way. So you, you know those things. And so I think the highlight here, um, you, you know them because you, you've said them already, which is really great. Um, the highlight here is, yes, yeah, to take action, to gradually disengage from those people, hopefully with wisdom and you know with love in our heart, or at least a certain non-harming in our heart, so goodwill if possible, at least no ill will for them, disengaging, disengaging or shrinking the relationship as best we can in practical ways, and then increasing our involvement with other people. And one way to do that also is certainly to rest your mind on teachings, to listen to people who speak to you and, and just kind of clock more minutes in every day, you know, tuning into the wisdom channel, you know, or the beauty channel, uh, including the beauty of other people. And I, for me, I think that's a progressive process. I do believe that we're coming around the corner with COVID in many countries of the world. You know, there are a lot of bumps ahead still, many definitely in the past, but, you know, more opportunities will increase with technology, more opportunities to interact with people online. So I think that's, it's a really important thing you're saying here. Um, the Buddha famously said that um, wise companions is the whole of the holy life. And, and you're speaking to the importance of that. So thank you. You're welcome. But just any very specific, like, this is a good place to go, W. Oh, you mean in terms or, of communities of different kinds? Yes. 
Very okay. practical. Yeah. Gosh, I've already disengaged, but now I'm just where do you live? Engaged. Where do you Washington, live? Washington, D.C. Yeah. Well, uh, Tara Broxanga, I think, is a, you know, is a hub. I, yeah. 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 Many spokes coming out from that wheel, but boy, that's a hub of a wheel. Um, and I think, uh, you know, people who tend to gather in in situations in which they're promoting the greater good, that tends to filter for and increase the odds of finding, you know, like-minded people who are leaning in a good direction. I think about that. Um, D.C., you know, I... Um, it's easy to stereotype it. You know better than I the nature of it, but so many people there are motivated to try to help things get better. And whatever their kind of political views may be, they're they're often actually trying to help things get better, including in a lot of NGOs, nonprofits of different kinds. There are many mindfulness communities, different flavors. I've taught a certain amount around DC and that area immediately around it. And there's a lot of good stuff happening there. So I would, you know, reach out in those ways. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And to come into these things, maybe I'll finish on this point, with kind of a confidence that others will want to be with you, right? You're making a bid, in effect. And um, as part of that bid, it can, it can help to have a certain confidence that, you know, uh, they'll presume a welcome until there's evidence to the contrary. I think that's kind of helpful, especially if you're sort of a shy, introverted uh, person like me who's got whacked a few times, you know, when he tried to join groups as a kid in school uh, to, you know, internalize this, uh, a presumption that you'll be welcomed unless you can see otherwise. Okay. 